Good morning to everyone. Good morning. Good morning. What I'm going to try to do today is uh, challenge your assumptions a little bit. Actually, you think a little bit differently about some of the issues you face every day. Uh, I'd like to get a sense. How many in this room uh, tweet at all? Okay, good. How many have face, uh, Facebook? Okay, how many wish Facebook and tweet was never created? <laughs> we're going to come back to that before we're done. Uh, what I'm going to try to do today is I'll go through uh, five different areas. I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about the reauthorization, uh, ESSA, and kind of under the hood of it a little bit to look at it in terms of what I think it may mean for you as superintendent. I want to talk about, because of ESSA, um, because of some changes going on, if anyone hasn't noticed, we're in the midst of a political season. Uh, if anyone hasn't noticed, America is politically polarized beyond anything I've seen in my adult lifetime. And the importance of what that may mean to a communication plan for school districts. Uh, then I want to talk about defining the problem. The problem is we got to prepare kids for their future, not our past. A little bit about how to effectively use data in that. And then close by asking you to think about some action plans that you might personally take in your own district. Let me begin with ESSA. Now, I had the privilege of being uh, in the discussions with the reauthorization. I had the privilege of being with a committee uh, Arnie Duncan and myself, the last ones in the room, in December, when they kind of cut their final deal. And they were surprised because Washington is totally polarized. Yet ESSA went through faster than any piece of federal legislation in education has gone through in modern history. And it had almost unanimous <coughs> support on both sides of the aisle. Why? How in the polarized system did they get it through? How did they get almost unanimous support on both sides of the aisle? I think we as uh, superintendents really need to think about that. And here's my reason. I believe they gave up. <clears throat> Sit in that room when the chairman said, we give up. We just give up. And what were they saying? They didn't say schools were unimportant. They concluded that they had taken so much uh, hit from the left and the right around Common Core, around No Child Left Behind, and that truly education is not a federal responsibility. They clearly understood that. They said, we didn't create any of these standards. That was the Council of Chief State School Officers and National Governors Association. We just tried to create some funds for it because all the constituents were telling us they needed funds to implement it. And we got beat up. And we got bigger issues that are going to hit us in the immediate future than education. And so we, we're done. Uh, he said, we don't want to have anybody think education is not important, but we can't do it from Washington. And so what we want to do is try to figure out how does it work. And what they tried to look at then is what they called the nation's most rapidly improving schools. And that's what ended up bringing me to the table. Um, the nation's most rapidly improving schools and to see what they were doing differently than everybody else. And maybe the legislation could give some guidance on that. And so they looked at this group of schools. And by the way, just so you know, I'm going to give you my PowerPoint uh, at the end. In addition to the PowerPoint, we'll send you a website where the slides are backed up by white papers. So that you can pick and choose stuff you might want to share with a board, with your executive staff, whatever. On the left-hand side, if you put the percentage of kids who are on free and reduced, uh, I'm sorry, on the left-hand side, percentage of kids who are either proficient or advanced on the state test. I happen to put the third grade up here. I got every grade, okay? But look at them, percentage that are proficient or advanced. Across the bottom, the percentage who are on free and reduced lunch. Who they studied was that group of schools. 
Um, for the past nine years, in partnership with the Council of Chief State School Officers, with funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates <coughs> Foundation, we've been studying deeply those schools to see what they're doing differently. And so they said, they brought us in and said, what is it they do differently? And one of the things we found that they do differently is they are far more focused on the future than the past. And in effect, these schools almost had said, and I thought Congress would want to shoot me when I told them this, they said, they paid no attention to you. They paid little attention to what the feds were saying. They actually paid little attention to what their state was saying. And they said, look, we are struggling so badly. We have so many challenges. We're going to try to just do the best we can. And if you don't think we're doing well enough, take our schools over. You can have them. And nobody really wanted them. And so when we began to see it, now they were not civilly disobedient, but they paid far less attention to the latest piece of state and federal legislation than the rest of us in the room did. Um, they, in effect, took control of their schools. They said, we'll do the best we can with what we got. Given that, the feds made a decision. They will no longer define AYP. What they said is, you need to create your own AYP. And what I have found is few states and hardly any school districts have listened to that part of the new piece of le federal legislation. Why they said that is they got beat up because of the new teacher evaluation program and it's tied to the state test. It got beat up by the test. So they said, we give up. You decide what, what it is you want in your AYP. Folks, let me explain what I think happened. We chased the car, like the dog chasing a car, and the dog caught the car. <laughs> what are you going to do? What are you going to do in the state? What are you going to do locally to define AYP, to, ex to explain improvement in student performance? Are you going to do anything different than the education establishment for the last five years have complained bitterly about? And parents have pushed back on it. And they said, Maybe what we got to do is look beyond the, box, uh, the present box. And so in the legislation, the most common word, other than the word the, <coughs> is innovation. Uh, it's in, because these schools up in that top corner that I talked about, they don't look like your schools anymore. They've done things fundamentally differently. And when it says innovation, it further states in the legislation multiple times that you've got to figure out how to put career ready on equal academic footing. And I underscore the word academic footing here with college ready. It doesn't say put career and tech ed on equal footing with college prep. That's just what we hear as educators because that's our paradigm. It says put career ready on equal academic footing with college ready. So one of the things I'll try to do by 11.30 is explain what the difference is in terms of the academics of 21st century workplace versus the academics of higher education. And they are fundamentally different. And with each passing year, grow further and further and further apart. Um, <coughs> how many of you are so old, <laughs> you were working in schools in 1983. Okay. What national report came out that year about American education, 1983? The nation at risk. At risk. At risk. Uh, anybody ever here, no child left behind? <laughs> anybody ever here, a common core? Since 83, every major piece of federal initiative, what group is it that has been putting all the pressure on elected officials
to reform and improve our schools? Is it the kids demanding higher standards? Is it your faculty coming together demanding they be made to do more and different things? My economic development. It, who is it? My economic development. It's the economic development people. It's the business community. For 33 straight years. But the problem is, and they readily will tell you this, they really don't know what they need, they just know what they're getting is not what they need. And what they did was turn to the Inside the Beltway group, which candidly I have made a living off of for the last 25 years. And who are they? It's AASA. It's Conflict Chief State School Officers. It's the two major teacher unions. It's ASCD. It's the National Association of Secondary School Principals. It's the National Association of Elementary School Principals. They turn to the Inside the Beltway group to say, how do we improve the schools? And what did they do? They went back to what they knew. They used rear view management approach. They look in the mirror to see where we've been to decide where we should go. And what they did was double down simply. They doubled down on the past. Well, folks, they just handed the ball to you. They just handed the ball to you and said, we, did, we messed it up. We couldn't do it. So how are you going to do it? Are you going to use any different indicators, any different structures than we now have in place? The schools up in that top corner did not. See, there's two approaches to school reform. One is called the fixed mindset. The fixed mindset looks at what we have in place and works really, really hard to figure out how to improve it. The growth mindset puts a stake in the ground three to five years out and says, let me build back. Let me build back from the future. And that's what those high performing schools did. That's what that group did. They built back from the future. Uh, in the process, they recognized it meant a change, not simply what was happening in the classroom. It was a boardroom to classroom approach. They changed everything. They changed the cabinet. They changed what the role of a principal was. They changed what you did at the classroom level. Uh, but in all cases, they were deeply committed to a basic pre premise, rigorous learning for all kids. That's not unlike what all of you believe. But they understood in the 21st century, these kids learn differently. These kids are natives of a technological world. And your instructional, to have a structural effectiveness, yes, you've got to teach differently, but you've got to organize your buildings differently in your districts differently. Uh, as you do that, we believe it begins with a communication. <coughs> now, I just gave you a quick overview of ESSA. I'm going to hit this communication plan, and then we're going to put you to work at your tables for a few minutes and just think about what should we be doing differently in our own district around a communication plan given the realities of ESSA. Then I'm going to go in and put the stake in the ground five years out and try to describe best I can what I think kids are going to need to know, do, and be like that is different than what we're now teaching in our schools. And one of the key things is going to be to figure out how to communicate that. Because everybody knows what school should be. See, isn't this true? Most of our teachers liked school when they were kids. In fact, they liked school so much they went to college to major in school. So when they graduated from college, they could return to school to do to others what had been done to them. And let me, anybody in this room ever teach in elementary school? Can anybody ever taught in third grade? Okay, when you teach in third grade, where has the pressure always been? Third grade needs to get the kids ready for? The test. The test and? Fourth grade. Fourth grade. <laughs> Ask the fourth grade teacher what that third grade teacher better do. What's the purpose of uh, fourth grade? Fifth grade. Fifth grade. 
grade. Fifth grade. So the purpose of elementary school is to get them ready for what? Middle school. Middle school is supposed to get them ready for? High school. High school is supposed to get them ready for? College. Purpose of school is school. Think about it. So let's go to the communication plan. I believe everybody in this room has one, two, three, probably not more than four at most. People who are your most intimate friends, colleagues, confidants. It may be your spouse. It may be a sibling. It may be a lifetime friend you've had since elementary school. We all have this one little, small, tight inner group that we communicate with often. But then we get a second group. The second group are the group that we see every day. Who are they? They are the people who work in central administration with you. They are your principals. They are your school board. They are people you go to church with. They are people whose kids play on the Little League with your kid. These are people we see often. We know their name. We know their, a little bit about their family. Uh, but don't have quite that same relationship as we have with that inner circle. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Then we all have a third group. And the third group are people that we personally don't know so well, but we share a common belief, bond, or responsibility with. And who is that? It's everybody in the room. When you as superintendents walk in this room, you can instantly start a conversation, can't you? Okay, how you doing with whatever it is the present pressures are. They are people who you, you share a common group, a belief with. Could be a job function or it could be a belief, but you don't see them so often. You don't know a lot about their families, you don't know a lot about you know, maybe you might not even know where they went to college. You might even know if they're married or not married. Folks, what happened is social media has changed all this. A little bit for us and enormously for the millennials. And what has happened is that outer ring has become the second ring. And I want to suggest to you that somebody has really figured it out. Whether you like him or hate him, Donald Trump has got that mastered. How many tweet? How many of you tweeted with Donald Trump? Not part of our group, is he? Just like him, don't we? Who just run your, won your primary? <laughs> Have you looked at the demographic that's voting for him? <clears throat> Have you really looked at it carefully? They are the very parents that you can't get the back to school night. They are the very parents who are disenchanted, disenfranchised with the system. They are the very group that Congress is scared to death of. Because what they have mastered is the ability to feel for the first time they have a voice. They have a voice. Now, you know who's really unhappy with Donald Trump? See if I'm right. The gatekeepers of the Republican Party. They're scared to death of this guy. Am I right? Mm -hmm. And so they're trying whatever they can to block him. I'm not here to support him. Please believe that, okay? That's not my goal here. 
My goal is to talk about effective communication with a millennial generation in, in the 21st century. And what happened is an interesting scenario. Uh, he tapped into them with a vengeance. And when you go back, Congress said, America gave up on us. And they got mad at us because they felt we weren't listening, even though we thought we had listened. We took the standards. We, took the, we didn't create the standards. We didn't create the test. We didn't even make a recommendation on the test. It came from CCSSO and NGA. We did what they told us to do, and we got beat up. But the rank and file said, you weren't listening. Folks, do you understand what just happened? In education, they just handed the ball to us. And you know what you just told me? You're not communicating with them. Because we know best. We have our degrees. We have years of experience. Everybody in our circle thinks the same way. They just need to listen to us. Anyone want to tell me how that's going to play out? God, I hope I'm wrong. But I'll tell you what I believe. You're sitting in the same place Congress did 12 and 24 months ago. And they're going to come right after you because you're the new enemy. Because you don't listen. And I don't mean you personally. I'm part of this too. Please understand. And I'm not here. I don't like, I don't support Donald Trump. But maybe there's a real lesson we should be learning here. I followed your election earlier this week. I not only followed the election that he won, did you look at the disaggregated data of who voted for him in your state? It was the millennials who have school age kids. <laughs> and the more likely they were blue collar versus white collar, they're more likely to have voted for. Aren't they the very parents we're struggling with the most? I call it the Donald Trump Bernie Sanders scenario. <clears throat> Not that I want to support them. <clears throat> I want to learn from what they have figured out that I don't think we have. <clears throat> this group <clears throat> is communicating with a vengeance. I have a sign, Sam, Ed, I just signed one person in my office simply said, your number one responsibility, I don't care if you do anything else, I want you tracking the messages. We need to have our ear to the ground. 